All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Explorer Classroom event. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, I want to give a huge welcome to everybody on behalf of National Geographic Education. We're so happy to see you all joining us today. National Geographic believes in the power of exploration and wonder to change the world. The heart of our National Geographic community is our explorers, who are cutting edge scientists and researchers, transformative educators, and powerful storytellers. Explorer Classroom's live video events connect students with National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As in a commitment to supporting educators, students, and families during this transition. We are now providing Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So if you like, you can join us on Monday and we will be back in action again. All right, really excited to have Alex Burkowski joining us today. Alex is a big cat biologist from South Africa. He's researched lions, um, and leopards across South Africa and Uganda and filmed other big cats across three continents. He's worked with Steve Winter and National Geographic as a photographic assistant on magazine and television assignments describing leopards, jaguars, lions, and a recent production had him filming the incredible tree climbing lions in southwestern Uganda. So before I turn things over to Alex, I just want to give a shout out to all the groups who are joining us live today. We have students joining us live on camera from across North America. We've also got tons joining us on YouTube, Canada, the United States. We even have groups joining us in Angola, France, India, Sweden, and Spain. So it's so great to have so many live groups joining us today. And in fact, we've got Alex joining us from down under, Alex joining us uh, in Australia. So that is more than enough for me. I'm gonna toss things over to Alex. Alex, it's so great to have you joining us live today. And we're excited to get to know you a little bit better. Thank you so much. I've got my National Geographic uh, hoodie on. And uh, let's kick things off. I'm just going to share my screen here. I'm going to share my screen so we can do this. Okay, share. And uh, hi, everybody. Hi. Everybody can hear me, I'm sure. Can, can everybody hear me? We got Perfect. You. All right, Joe, I'm going to jump straight into it. Um, yeah. I'm going to, do, going to do the same thing that I did last time. I'm going to fly through this. I've got about 15 to 20 minutes, right? Perfect. Yep. All right. Let's kick things off. Um, how do I? All right. Here we go. Hey, guys. Okay, cool. So um, I've titled this talk, Big Cats, Why We Need to Save Them and How You Can Help. Uh, thanks to Joe for the fantastic introduction. Uh, I'm going to kick things off right now just by telling you a little bit about who I am. So my name is Alex Bechkovsky and I uh, have been working on big cats for about the last 10 years of my life. This is me in Cuisine Natal um, about, wow, this is 2012, um, catching a leopard that we were removing a satellite collar from. So in this particular part of the world, it's, uh, it's a place in the northeastern part of South Africa where we were trying to figure out how leopards and people live together and uh, what the threat is of uh, leopards from human hunting. Um, a couple of years ago, about five years ago, I switched from being a pure scientist to starting to work with this man. His name is Steve Winter. A lot of you probably know him. You follow him on Instagram. He is a uh, famous big cat photographer. Uh, and he was uh, actually taking photos of, of leopards in that same part of the world. That's where I met him. And then later I became one of his um, main cameramen and photo assistants. And sort of over the last five years that um, I've been working on, with him on a number of different assignments from jaguars to lions to leopards, tigers. Um, but let's start off with um, a couple of, of, of sort of simple questions that I think uh, a lot of you would be interested in that might have some ideas. Um, can anybody tell me why big cats are important. All uh, right, Joe, Alex. Can you, can you take this into the sort of classroom realm over here? Yeah, absolutely. So we have some groups joining us from home. I'm, I'm going to pick on a few of them now. So let's try Jake in San Francisco. Jake, why do you think big cats are important? Well, big cats could, are probably very important to the food chain because if you remove them, then there's just a giant ep empty spot in the chain which could lead to overpopulation possibly that's 100 percent right so um exactly so so uh big cats uh but also other carnivores like wolves bears they're known to um 
uh, in science, we call it, they, they're known to exude. When you exude something, you, you put pressure on, but basically they, they do top-down pressures on other animals. So basically, um, they are right at the top of the food chain. And what they do is, they, as you said, they eat things like deer. They, eat, they actually sometimes even eat smaller carnivores like coyotes and lynxes and bobcats. And they basically, as you say, control the populations of other animals. When you lose them at the top, um, you can get overpopulation and um, you can actually get big changes in the ecosystem, which sometimes are not good. So that's a spot on. Um, what is his name? Jake, right? Well done. Anybody else? All right. Let's see. Let's go to Maryland. And we have Romy joining us. Um, well, I think they're a keystone species. So without them, all of it would just collapse and they would come into, and since we're already taking off where they live by cutting down trees um, and diseases, um, when they are extinct, there will be just too much overpopulation. That's 100% right. They're a keystone species and they also, you said that's very important. So basically when, um, uh, when you lose them, you actually increase disease. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And um, yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Well done. Um, to touch on your point about diseases, so this is a in Mumbai in, in India. Mumbai is a big city in sort of Western India. And um, Basically, what this leopard is doing um, is this leopard, along with about 35 others in a city park in the middle of, uh, of Mumbai, actually control dog populations, and the dogs sometimes bite people. So you're dead right about the, the spreading of disease. This is in Western Uganda. This is one of the tree climbing lionesses that I, um, that I uh, photographed here. Very really important tool. And in this world, every line is worth about 14,000 to the tourism sector. Every year, people pay to go on safari, and that is incredibly important to the government and to the people that live with lions. Uh, so, here's a, a couple of research projects that we did on the leopards in India, and we found that these leopards eat about 1,500 dogs every year. And they save about 90 human lives through uh, the power of eating those dogs because the dogs breed rabies, they bite people. Um, so that's basically what those dogs do. Um, this is a little slide that I always put up because um, these are the different ways that leopards are incredibly important to us. And um, the, even in Africa, they are also sometimes hunted. Uh, on, on um, trophy hunting safaris, which is obviously in many cases quite bad. Um, now I wanted to show you a little video of the leopards that walk in downtown Mumbai. So that was a video that was taken by Steve Winter. And those are the leopards that live in a city very close to people and eat those dogs. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of stray dogs that nobody looks after and that bite about 70,000 people every year. Uh, so this is a map of the national park, and this is the area where the leopards live alongside people, the sort of orange hatched area. So that's where leopards, dogs, and people interact. And you can see on this, um, um, this figure over here that in an, in, if, if, if dogs were to disappear, so if, we, um, if dogs went extinct, as you said, Basically, there would be an explosion of dogs and it would cost a lot here also in this figure over here, it would cost a lot more to control dog populations and uh, the rabies and the disease that they spread would be much higher. So leopards are actually keeping all those things down. I'm going to talk a little bit about cat photography. Um, so this is uh, something that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. A lot of you follow Nat Geo Wild, National Geographic. You see a lot of these incredible images online. Um, I'm going to talk a little about the lines. So the lines actually climb trees. So 
lions climb trees all over Africa, but um, this is one of three populations in the world that have actually got um, a culture of tree climbing. Now, what that means is that every lion in the population climbs trees every day. They start at about 7 a.m. and they come down at about sunset. So now this place where I was working is sort of on the border of three countries. It's on the border of Rwanda, Uganda, and uh, the Congo. And the park that I was working in is called Queen Elizabeth National Park. It's an incredible place because it's one of the, it's, it's the only area in the world, well, in, in the whole of Africa, that's got the highest species diversity for vertebrates. So any animals with a backbone, this is the place where there's the most animals per uh, unit area. So you have elephants, you've got the tree climbing lions. Um, you've got these incredible places. Um, you've got chimpanzees, gorillas, lions living all in the same park. And this is the little research vehicle that I did the photography and the videography out of. And you can see that this is one of the only big main roads in the national park. So it's, um, it's a crazy place, but one of the most beautiful places in the whole of Africa, in the whole of East Africa. Um, so when we got there, um, there was a story done by National Geographic in, uh, I think, 2011 by a, a man called um, Joel Satori. And he's quite famous for taking incredible images like this. So Joe actually came here about 10 years ago and took some pretty incredible images of these lines that climb the trees. And this one was voted as one of the top 50 images ever taken by a National Geographic uh, photographer. So these are the kinds of images that he got. And he got some pretty, pretty cool shots, like really, really different sort of things, you know, lions, big maned lions with black manes sort of hanging out in these big um, fig trees. Um, Lions in the south of the park, sorry, in the north of the park also climb euphorbias. So they're big cactus-like trees. Uh, Joe was also the first guy to actually use a uh, buggy cam, which put a uh, Nikon camera uh, onto a remote controlled vehicle and actually took photos close up of the lions. But now I wanna show you something. I just wanna show you a little bit of footage of what this place looks like. So they're the big cactus trees, euphorbias. And I'm going to show you what the lions are climbing and the little baby lions as they learn to climb. Pretty cool. Did everybody see that? Joe, was that pretty stable in terms of the internet? Yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, there's lots of people on right now, but we could see what was happening for sure. All right. Cool. Well, let, let's keep going. So, um, so when we got there, uh, this is the kind of thing that we were facing every day. There were these lions that were actually climbing these big cactus-like euphorbia trees, and you saw that in the video. So we were using a long lens kind of experimenting, getting a little bit closer to the lions. See, this is a little lion cub that had learned to climb a tree. Um, and um, when we got there, we sort of asked ourselves the question, how can we do things differently in a way that nobody has done before? Um, so if you, uh, the explorer, classroom, hangout people can all think about what some of the methods you would use if you were in a situation where you had to photograph lines that climb trees 
what would some of the things be that uh, you would use? Can can Joe? Can you can you sort of uh, give us some some options? Absolutely. So I'll check the chat. So if anybody listening right now can think of some options that they could try to get really cool pictures of uh, the lines in the trees. But let's try a couple of groups. Let's go to the Bruce family in Mississippi. What do you think? What's one strategy you might try? Um, drones with cameras on them. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's um, <laughs> that's exactly the right answer. Um, all right, anybody else? There, there, there might be some other people that can uh, that can answer this question. Think about any technology that we have in existence today. Yeah. And uh, how would you how you'd photograph them? Let's try Aurora in Washington D.C. Oops, the microphone just went off. There we go. You're on Aurora. Um, a drone. Like you could use a drone to get it up. It would like you could. I feel like it'd be also better to have like a, a smaller size to like maybe get into smaller places, tight spaces. Yeah, that's a hundred percent right. Um, let's take two more, maybe. Sure. Let's see if anything came in online. Uh, Dana suggesting cameras mounted in the trees. Dana's one hundred percent right. Dana's one hundred percent right. Yeah, and then let's see. Uh, yeah, another one. <laughs> okay, well, this is Thomas maybe went a little bit far, but he's talking about maybe tranquilizing one of the lions and putting on like um, critter cam. Critter cam, man. Um, that's close. So the closest thing that we did to that is actually physically climb into the trees. And what we did is we would get onto these big, um, they're called high ace pickups. They're actually like big buses that people use. You can put about 12 people in here. But what I would do is I'd climb onto the roof here and I'd actually climb into the tree with the lions. That's the closest thing we did to the idea of putting a crew cam on. Crew cam is cool. So yes, to everybody that says drones, this is the kind of footage that you can get with drones. So this is a male lion called Jacob. And let me just get some footage of we actually flew the drones. So, uh, Here's the little drone, and there is us flying the drone towards Jacob. There's a little orbit shot, and there you can see is as close as we got to Jacob. And what we did is we progressively flew closer and closer to him, like over like a week, over two weeks maybe, conditioning him until he got super relaxed, and then he just sort of saw it as like a big bird. So, um, yeah. So that was, and then we also got stills. So we got shots like this. So we did video and we did stills. Video and we did stills. Sort of as every day went, we got some video and we got stills. There he is with his sister. There he is again. Oh, with his sister again. Sorry. Here's some orbits. Again, of the lines, I don't know if the connection's stable for you to see this, but basically this is us in the trees with them. Here's Jacob nearly taking out his sister. Pretty crazy. And again, you can see the video of Jacob. If you guys have got Disney Plus, Disney Plus, the new Netflix, uh, like, uh, killer, maybe, I don't know. It might be better than Netflix. Uh, Disney Plus, if you go onto National Geographic, you can click tree climbing lions. The film is on there. So if you want to watch it there. Nobody said camera traps. The closest thing we had was mounting a camera into the tree. We did that. But this is camera traps. So what we did is we put cameras on the ground, cameras in the trees, cameras on kills. And then we got lights to help at night. And these are some of the images that we got. Pretty cool. There is um, Kagiri, a female that we actually satellite collared, uh, eating a, um, a big water buck. And then we came to climb into the trees. So these are some of the images that we got. This is after they ate a big water buck. There they are in the trees there. Pretty cool. Boom. Boom. This one I call the lion tree house because there's so many in the tree. It's pretty cool what you can see there. And basically here what we've done is we've actually used the flash. So you've got the backlight of the setting sun, that blue, and then a little bit of flash on the face. Actually, this one's got quite a lot of flash on the face, but that's how we got it to pop. 
Oh, this is close. I was right underneath them with this one. Probably too close. Should never get this close to lions, guys. They might jump on you. Uh, another one. Super close. Blue light. I like it. Oh, this one's cool. Big orange light, and then we got a bit of balancing with the off-camera flash. Pretty cool. Whoa. That one's super close, too. Um, okay. Now, I want to talk about something because I know there are many people in this crowd that are probably thinking about becoming scientists or cameramen. Am I right? Probably quite a lot of people that are thinking about this as a future career. And I have some good news for you. So um, a lot of the, 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 the time, a lot of people ask, you know, how do you get started with all this stuff? Do I need expensive equipment? Do I need a lot of money? What do I need to do? And I want you guys to know that you can make cool stories and you can make cool videos and you can make cool things with this little iPhone. So all of the power has actually got to do with the story and not got anything to do with how good your camera is. I wanna show you guys something. So uh, just a few days ago, we were in a kangaroo rehabilitation center here in Victoria. And most of the shooting that I was actually doing, I was shooting on an iPhone. And um, most of the video of the kangaroos I was doing, most of the video of the talking to the camera I was doing was all with this because it's so small and it's so compact. But just so you know, to get started, you can do it all. You can get a drone, you can get a really good camera to take video and pictures and a tripod. You can do all of that for less than $1,000. So something like this, this little Fuji Film XT costs about 500 bucks. This little drone, this little Mavic Spark, this little, sorry, DJI Spark costs about $300. And a little tripod like this only costs about $100. And that's really all you need. So a little drone like this will help you to get aerial shots, show landscapes of where you're working. This little camera over here will do incredible 4K video. It'll even do it in slow motion. And this tripod will just give you the stability to be able to shoot with. But this is really it, is that if you guys want to be presenters, if you want to be cameramen, if you want to be scientists, and you think that you need fancy, expensive equipment, that's a lie. It's not true. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's me for today. I don't know if there's, um, and the people that you can look at who do really good Instagram stories are the guy over here, this is Charlie Hamilton James. There's another really good guy that I'm sure you guys follow, Bertie Gregory. He also does incredible Instagram stories talking to the camera. Steve Winter also does those things. But as I say, you can do all of this stuff. 90% of it is with your iPhone. Joe, I'm happy to field some questions. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk more on the big cat science, but I think we've probably run over in terms of time. So let me know. Yeah, Alex, let's rock some questions. Why don't you hit the stop screen share at the top and come back to us? Yeah. All right. So Alex, obviously a huge thank you. That was an amazing presentation, especially the tree lion action. Pretty darn cool. For the folks at home, we do want to issue a little challenge this afternoon. So if you're in grades kindergarten to grade five, we're challenging you to draw a picture or a comic strip of something you learned from Alex today. Grades five to eight, your challenge is to write a short news article about Alex. And if you're in high school, your challenge is to produce a short video explaining something you learned or something about Alex's work today. If you put those on Twitter, tag at Nat Geo Education, hashtag Explore Classroom. We'd love to see them and we can make sure that Alex sees them as well. So we're going to start meeting some of our live groups and then we are going to take questions from the chat sidebar as well. So let's get things rolling. Let's start off with all right, let's go to Amelia. Amelia's hanging out with us in Texas. Alex, you can see she's got a friend with her. Uh, how's it going, Amelia? Uh, good. Um, we have heard that a tiger named Nadia. Nadia has the coronavirus. How does it affect big cats or tigers like her? Uh, you know what, I think, I think at this stage, um, I think the science, so the, the information on all of the stuff is still very young. So we don't really know how it affects big cats yet. What we do know about the coronavirus is that it jumped from another animal. It's called a zoonotic disease. So zoonotic, basically um, any zoonotic disease is a disease that comes from an animal and comes into people. 
So we didn't know up until this time that it can also go from humans into other animals. And I think for now, they, the, the, the zookeepers at the Bronx Zoo seem to think that it's not going to affect Nadia badly, but we don't know. It's just too early yet. We probably need a few more weeks for scientists and researchers to work on it. But it's a very, very important question. It just seems that the tigers cough, just like people. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Moira, hanging out with us in Kentucky. Let me get that microphone turned on. Hey, my students have some questions for you. Um, yeah. One of my students wants to know, um, what made you want to be a big cat researcher? Oh, big cat researcher. Yeah, uh, I was very lucky. So there were big cats that were actually living around my university. Um, and there were actually leopards living in the forest nearby my university. And then I was sort of, I just heard about that. And I was like, man, these, these would be cool to study. Um, but yeah, I just, I just think big cats are incredibly enigmatic. They look cool. They, they are incredibly important to ecosystems. Um, you know, there's just something regal about them. I think those are the main reasons that I wanted to study them. But I, it was mainly because they were living around my university. Probably easier if I unmute myself. There we go. Uh, great questions to start. We're going to come back to the live uh, camera classes, but let's take a few off YouTube. So Valerie wants to know, Alex, how do you tell the lions apart and give them names? How can you tell one lion from another? Yeah, so that's a very important question. And I see that this presentation had one, a few more slides. I'm just going to share my screen if I can. So basically to, uh, to do that, uh, we basically um use a process known as a whisker spot identification can everybody see that so basically um this is that same male line this is jacob and these are several different images of jacob so there's the one where he's standing on the tree there's the one where he's lying on the tree but basically jacob like people has a kind of fingerprint and that fingerprint is on his whiskers exactly like the cat that you have at home so this is something that's uniquely uh, individual to every single different big cat on planet Earth. I don't care if it's an ocelot, I don't care if it's a lion, I don't care if it's a leopard. All have different whisker spot patterns. You can see that Jacob over here has got three on the top. He's got one, two, three, four, five, six on the second uh, row of whiskers. And then he's got this kind of one, two, three, four, five on the third row. And that is a unique marker. It's like a fingerprint. And as I say, all of the cats, whether it's a lion, whether it's a leopard, um, they can be differentiated based on their whisker spot pattern. And also with the lion, sometimes we can look at the, the darkness of their nose and they also have spots on the nose. So those are the two ways that we identify these different big cats. All right. Awesome. Let's steal another question here. This is from Agana. And they're wondering if... Uh, You've ever had uh, any close calls while working with the big cats? And then she's wondering whether uh, the leopards uh, harm people in Mumbai sometimes when they're close to the city. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I only, I only had one really close call with some lions in Uganda like two years ago. And that was pretty crazy because um, for some reason, the lions um, showed an interest in my vehicle unlike any way that I've ever seen. You know, usually when you photograph film and do science on big cats and you're in a vehicle, they just look at you as being part of the vehicle. They never look at you as a human. And this was the first time that the lions actually showed interest in me and I was very scared. So I kind of drove away, but um, they never did that afterwards. The second question, Joe, was? Uh, in Mumbai with the leopards being so close. Oh, if they attack people, right. Um, Yes, occasionally, sometimes the leopards do. And you know, when they, they really do that is so uh, it's unfortunately when, when, when small children are like playing outside close to the national park, because small children don't really look like humans. They're very small. So the, so if this is a leopard and this is the back of the leopard, so they say that's like one meter. And then you have like a big person that's like 1.8 meters. He stands high, tall. He's got forward facing eyes. He walks on two feet and he's an ape to, to, to leopard, we're all apes. You know, we, we, that's what we look like. 
that leopard's going to be quite scared because he's known that like, okay, this is something dangerous. A small child that's like five years old, much shorter, smaller angle of attack, doesn't really see it as a human, sees it as something else, maybe sees it even as a, like a monkey, you know, confuses it or like a small deer. So that's when small children get attacked. And then occasionally also when people go to the toilet, so you're standing on the top like this, say, look, your legs are here, right? Forward facing eyes, your head's here, like leopard nose, okay, oh, whoa, this is something scary, I'm gonna run away. Now you squat. Again, you've changed. You no longer look like a leopard. So boom, it's like it's a, it's a case of mis mistaken identity most of the time. That's when people get attacked. All right. Let's jump and back. when you show your back to a big cat. So you never run away from a big cat. So if you guys are ever on safari, if you come to Africa, go to India, whatever, and you're on foot, and you meet a big cat, as you meet an elephant, as you meet a rhinoceros, you don't really run. Actually, with a rhino, run away. Yeah, it's probably the best thing to do. But uh, elephant, don't run away. Lion, don't run away. <laughs> All right. Good advice. Uh, Aurora in DC. Let me turn your microphone on. I was wondering why the lion and lioness is climbing the trees. <clears throat> That's a very good question. And I like your cat. What is that? Who are we? Who's your colleague there? Who's your friend? What, what is that? What is that over there? I learned from my younger cousin. Um, you know, no, like, he wants to know who your friend is. Oh, this is. Yeah. I named well, you have two friends. Um, this is Katie. I think this is a leopard. I'm not sure, a cheetah, but. I think it's a tiger. Yeah, and this is Katie. And this is. Um, I haven't really named her. Okay, <laughs> let's give her a name. Her name is Jody. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So the question was why do the lionesses uh, climb trees? And it's a very good question. Now, there's three answers that a lot of people are uh, talking about in that part of the world as to why lions climb trees. And the first one is they do it because it's a vantage point for hunting. So they get higher so they can see the landscape. Second answer is that they do it to escape small flies that bite their face. And the third one, to me, that makes the most sense, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is, is that they are going into the trees because it's cooler. So Uganda is on the equator. Temperatures, I take it everybody here, most people are in Fahrenheit. Uh, so temperatures there regularly get over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So the, for the few people that are overseas, that's about 35 degrees Celsius. When you start to get into those temperatures, animals i don't care if those animals are us people i don't care if they're lions i don't care if they're elephants we start to sweat and we start to rapidly diminish in our ability to be able to cool ourselves so we actually start to die because we're getting so hot we're starting to which we're trying to cool ourselves by going into the trees it's likely that the temperature in the trees is about two maybe 1.5 two degrees celsius so maybe five to six degrees fahrenheit cooler then in the ambient temperature. Now that 1.5 to 2 degrees is all the difference when you're talking about these crazy temperatures of 35, 40 degrees Celsius or 100, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And this has been shown in Australia where I am right now with koalas. Also very hot forests, koalas are going up and you can actually see with a thermal gun, an infrared gun, that the koalas are a few degrees cooler up in the trees because of the ambient temperature change. Does that answer your question? Oh, we got another one. Oh my goodness, we got koalas. We have <laughs> koala bears. Great. Thank All right. you. Very cool, Aurora. Uh, let's see, Jake in San Francisco, your mic's on. Um, so in your discovery that leopards have a behavioral reaction to the scent of perfume, it says that most of the tests were occurred in zoos. Do you think that my, uh, the location of these tests might have affected the outcome? Or uh, did, just... you read, you, did you read my? Did you read my paper? Mm -hmm. Wow, thanks, man. Uh, no one really <laughs> reads my papers. You know, it's uh, it's kind of what I'm trying to get out of science. No one seems to read much of it. It seems that videos are a much better uh, way of 
educating people. So um, to, to um, answer your question, I think that yes, probably you're gonna get much better results in a zoo environment. And the reason why is because the cats are probably bored. That's what I would hypothesize. So hypoth when you say you hypothesize something or you make a hypothesis, you're making a prediction, right? You are saying that something's happening. So you as a young scientist could hypothesize that yes, because leopards, tigers, lions in zoos in like the Bronx Zoo are just hanging out most of the day. You know, they might see the odd person, but they don't really have a lot of space. A scent like Calvin Klein or Dolce & Gabbana in their cage is something that's crazy. And that's why they are more reactive versus a leopard that's walking around 15 kilometers a day and is encountering like 53 or 63 different scents. He might spend significantly less time, for instance, than a leopard, like investigating those things. But we did, we did actually in the Cape Mountains get pretty good results with certain, certain perfumes. Um, but yeah, the, the reason why we put perfumes out in front of camera traps was because we wanted to lure leopards and get better photos of the big cats for our science. Yeah. All right. Great. Does that question. answer your question? I hope it answers your question. Sorry. Uh, okay. Nicole, Nicole is curious about some of your work with servals and caracals. Can you talk a, a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so caracals, uh, let me try and get a little picture up here. Sorry, let me get a little picture because not a lot of people know what a caracal and a serval is. So a caracal, everybody, is this guy here. But they are actually related. So uh, caracals and servals, I'm just going to share my screen here, sorry. Uh, is my, share, is my screen still being shared? No. No. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Um, so guys, this is a caracal. And then this is a serval. And then they're in basically the same family. And they're, 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 um, they're not in the same genus, but they eat similar things. They've got a similar body size. So this is a caracal. Also, because they, they, their body to mass ratio and the power that comes out of their back feet, it, they've, they've got the, the, the two most um, powerful jumps in the cat kingdom, right? So you can literally see a caracal jump like, uh, like three, three and a half meters from a, from a standing start. And my work with them in, in the Cape Mountain. Basically, I was looking at caracals. I wanted to know how they live with leopards and how ecologically they have different niches. So niche in the classical Latin sense, a niche is actually a, it's one of those places in a church where you, where you put like a, a little figurine. Uh, so that's what, that's what a niche is, classically what it means. But in ecology, a niche is the role or the function that an animal fulfills in an ecosystem. So with caracals, niche is very different to a leopard. So niche there is to eat small little rodents, things like mice and rats. With leopards, eat much bigger things like deer, um, big uh, monkeys, uh, things like that. So I was basically trying to figure out what these things were eating and how they have different niches in the environment. With servals, I was just trying to take pictures of servals in this really cool, crazy place where they live in a power plant, one of the biggest power plants on earth where they produce petroleum and they have more servals than any other place in South Africa, crazily enough. So those are the two things that I was doing with them. All right. Very cool. Bruce family, Mississippi, your mic is on. What's your day-to-day -day life like with studying big cats? Right now I'm in lockdown. Uh, <laughs> There are no big cats right now. Right now, I'm actually, um, right now, the closest thing I've done to any wildlife shooting, I was actually filming leopards about three weeks ago. Um, but, but sort of, it, it really depends on what I'm doing. So like, if I'm doing my science stuff, so I've just finished my PhD, my days were quite boring. What I would do is I'd kind of be on my computer, I would be doing sort of statistical analyses, I'd be counting the different lines, I'd be writing scientific papers, uh, the most exciting stuff of that is actually the field work, which I'm going to be doing later this year. As soon as everything opens up again, I'll probably be going back to Uganda in July, August to do more lion counting. 
Um, and then you're doing camera work when you're doing all the drone stuff, when you're filming. And every day you're just searching for lions and you're filming them from your vehicle, from the drones. Um, so the field work part, as your question relates to, is definitely the most exciting part. Yeah. All right. Very cool. One more question. Let's visit uh, Romy in Maryland. Um, I saw the National Geographic on Big Cats, and I thought of a question that is, at what age do male cubs have to leave their pride if they have to leave the pride? Because there were only a few males, but there are a bunch of females. I like this question, Romy. This is a great question. It's one of my favorite questions. So uh, if we get down to the ecology, so the ecology of how these animals live. So let's focus on lions, but we can, it applies to any cat. Have you got cats at home? Have you got cats at home? I have this cat. Oh, you have uh, that cat. Well, even that cat. So uh, let's say that was a real tiger. But for people that have cats at home, uh, this would traditionally happen uh, also. But basically, cat society is essentially broken down into two uh, groups. So females and males. Okay. The first thing is that cats are polygamous. So one male covers many females. So he has like a, a big cat in its prime has got many girlfriends, maybe like four, five, five leopards, uh, females to every male. Okay. Um, they are also, uh, female leopards are also what they call philopatric philopatry. They don't leave. So when they grow up to about two years of age, they stay with mom. They stay with mom and, well, they don't stay with mom, but mom gives them a small part of her. So, um, with males, it's different. They're allopatric. They move away. They move big distances. They get chased out. They're getting chased by other males. And um, that typically happens at about two years of age, about two, two and a half, maybe three. So in that sort of 24 to 36 month range. And it doesn't matter if you're a lion, doesn't matter if you're a tiger, doesn't matter if you're a house cat. Generally at that age, you leave. And now it's time for you to find your own place where you can leave, where you can find a mate and where you can start your own family. And don't forget that the main role of those males when they're covering all those females is to protect their cubs from other males because they want to kill the cubs and they want to mate with those females. Does that answer your question, Rami? I hope it answers your question. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, first of all, I want to share, uh, explore classroom and many, many more educational resources at natgeoed.org. You can find them there. Also, we have more events coming up next week. So if you turn, tune in at this time next week, 2 p.m. Eastern, you can hang out with Alize Carrere, who will talk about how humans are adapting to climate change around the world. And we've got a special event following that at 3 p.m. Eastern with Allison. Allison is going to be live on a glacier in Alberta in the Rocky Mountains. And she's gonna show us how she drills into the ice and takes ice core samples. So that should be pretty cool uh, on Monday. A uh, huge thank you to all the groups who tuned in via YouTube. Thanks for all the amazing questions. Thank you to our groups at home who tuned in today. And Alex, thank you so much for taking us into your world, uh, teaching us a bit about the leopards and the tree lions and just why big cats are so important to our ecosystems. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for your time today. All right. Microphone's on. Nice and loud, boys and girls. Big thank goodbye. You. And thank thanks. you. Stay at home. Stay at right. home. <laughs> Stay at home. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. Great to see everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us on Explorer Classroom, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone.